Hello, everybody. I'm Storm Ushery, Conservation Education Manager with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And on today's recording, we've got Sergeant Josh Waldrip. He is a conservation officer here in the state of New Mexico, but he's in charge of the Carlsbad Supervisory. And he's going to be talking to us a little bit about dart gun use within wildlife management. And uh, he may talk a little bit more about some other things. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. I am Sergeant Josh uh, Waldrop with the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. Um, uh, as Storm has uh, described, uh, today I am going to discuss uh, the tools and techniques uh, that we as wildlife professionals use um, to administer immobilizing drugs to wildlife. Um, just as a background, uh, I have been a game warden with the department for going on 18 years. I first started my career in 2003 as the Tucum Carry Officer. I eventually transferred to Roswell um, and now reside in Artesia. I am currently the Carlsbad Supervisor District Supervisor and supervise officers in Artesia, Carlsbad, and Hobbs. Um, uh, my officers and I routinely patrol Eddy County, Lee County, and parts of Chavez and Otero counties. Um, to get started, uh, there are certain instances or circumstances um, when we use immobilization as a technique to manage our wildlife. Um, some of these um, instances uh, are problem or nuisance animals uh, that uh, need to be re relocated. Um, radio collaring, um, surveying or in collecting biological data um, such as DNA, um, or assessing and giving medical attention to injured wildlife. Um, here in the southeast area in particular, uh, we primarily deal with uh, problem or nuisance wildlife that have uh, come into contact with, with humans. Um, we routinely deal with bobcats, um, javelina, um, deer, and an occasional black bear um, that need to be safely immobilized um, or tranquilized and removed from, um, from a certain area. Um, in any circumstance uh, associated with this uh, part of the world or part of the job, the safety is our utmost concern. Um, the guns we use um, are to be treated as guns and, and the drugs can be, can be t deadly to wildlife and humans if used improperly. Um, all firearm safety rules apply when using any of these guns. Um, just like a bullet, um, the dart um, can be a deadly projectile um, if used in an unsafe manner. Um, the projector uh, that I, or rifle that I have used over the years is a uh, capture style uh, single shot uh, rifle. Um, it uses a 22 caliber blank uh, to propel the dart. Um, this rifle is capable of shooting darts up to 50 yards, give or take. Um, of course, that's um, concerning lots of practice. Um, it's a powerful firearm, but yet um, one downfall it has is the noise. Um, shooting a 22 caliber blank, um, the noise is consistent with that of a 22 long rifle being discharged, so it can be a little loud. Um, the second style that we commonly use um, is this CO2 uh, projector. This uh, uses compressed air in the form of CO2 uh, to propel the dart. It is equipped uh, with a small regulator um, that can be adjusted uh, um, for distance and the size of dart being applied um, at the time. Um, this is a very efficient um, and quiet gun, but can be uh, limited by distance. Um, you're talking 30 yards and closer on this particular device. Um, we generally or typically use the new dart uh, one, two, and three cc darts. Um, a one cc dart, which this one is here, um, administers holds and administers one cc of drug upon impact. A two cc dart administers two cc's of drug upon impact, so on and so forth. Um, 
These specialized darts um, have a small powder charge within them. Uh, when the dart hits the target, uh, a, the charge is ignited, and um, which causes a plunger to administer the drug through the needle into the animal. Um, these darts have barbs um, or a gel device that keeps the dart in the animal, keeps it from coming out until it can be safely removed. Um, when handling drugs, we uh, must use extreme caution. We use rubber gloves and eye protection to protect ourselves from drug exposure uh, uh, during this process. Um, you always want a partner, if possible, to assist you with this process um, in, in the event you, are, you um, come in contact with that drug, um, they can render aid if possible or if need be. The types of uh, drugs that we most commonly or typically use are telazole and, and xylazine um, for most of our applications. Um, telazole is used alone um, uh, for bears. Um, it's in a powder form. Uh, we inject a sterile water into this vial, uh, mix thoroughly, um, creating a solution that we then can inject into our darts. Um, we, uh, we use a telazole xylazine cocktail or mixture um, for an application such as, on such as deer, elk, or javelina. Um, xylazine is a liquid form um, that is, as well as injected into the telazole, creating that solution that is injected into the darts. Um, once our animals are immobilized, we uh, assess the health of the animal um, and safely remove the dart. Um, the darts can still be dangerous with, the, and they can have, still have some drug residue on them. They are placed in sharps containers um, and eventually destroyed in, in an incinerator. Um, every animal we dart um, receives an ear tag. Um, this ear tag in particular states do not consume um, due to the drugs on board. Um, a phone number is also included on the tag. So if an individual, individual can contact Game of Fish um, if they come in contact uh, with the animal. A database uh, is, 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 is kept um, with animal information um, that is tied directly back to this tag number, which in this case is 90, and the color of tag, which would be, which would be white. Um, when feasible, uh, an antibiotic is often given um, to animals to fight um, Infection, a possible infection that may do be, that may occur due to the do being darted. Um, that pretty much, in a nutshell, is a quick overview of of the items we use on a daily basis um, and um, what we do uh, to perform um, wildlife immobilization on our wildlife here in the state of New Mexico. Thank you, Josh. That was uh, very informative. Uh, you did a great job. Just a, a very quick overview of, of equipment, especially that district officers would have and uh, need while they're out in the field. And uh, it's one of those that, uh, that that's why I think if someone's interested in, in a career within wildlife and fisheries management, but they're more interested on the wildlife side that, you know, even if they um, or wanting to, you know, become a wildlife biologist and maybe they're not really interested in hunting. I still think that taking hunter safety is very important because you do go over firearm safety. And as a wildlife professional, you do have dart guns. There may be times using net guns where you're using equipment that, um, we must treat just like firearms. So, but but very good job. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I was going to tell a quick story about Josh. I, I met Josh while I was actually in college. I went to work a, a turkey trap up in Tucumcari when he was the district officer there. And there was about four of us uh, from our university that got to go up and work with uh, Josh. And uh, I know Mark Olson was there. 
um, Chad James. There was a handful of, of folks up there and uh, we had a great time and Josh treated us uh, really, really good. We had a good time. We learned a lot, but uh, just wanted to share that. I've known Josh for quite a while. And uh, before I let you go and let you off the hook today, Josh, um, I was hoping you might have an interesting story that you might be able to share with us. Maybe it was one where you all had to capture an animal. Um, but if you have any interesting stories for us today. Absolutely. The first one to come to mind um, occurred, uh, I think, in the summer of 2019. Um, Officer Don Norton and myself received a call um, of a bear that had been had fallen into a water storage tank in the Guadalupe Mountains. Um, we responded to the area. Um, it happened to be a large water tank, probably 10 foot tall, 10 foot in diameter, and um, had a top hatch on it. Then the rancher had left a ladder accessing that top hatch because he was doing some maintenance on that tank. Um, luckily, the tank didn't have but 16 or 18 inches of water in it. Um, a bear uh, miraculously climbed that ladder. And I'm assuming went in head first in that, in that manhole. And being that he did that, had to have ended up right on his face when he fell in that tank. But luckily the tank didn't have much water in it and he didn't drown. Um, a day or two later, I'm not sure of the time frame. We don't know exactly when he went in, but the rancher was making the rounds, checking waters and, and heard a noise within the tank. And climbed up the ladder, looked in and was... Uh, very surprised to see a 250 pound uh, black bear, a red faced black bear, salmon faced black bear staring him in the face. Uh, he immediately called us, we responded, and um, it happened to be a, a very windy, rainy day. Uh, lightning was cracking, and we were nervous to get up there and get it done and get out of there. And uh, luckily, we were uh, successfully, we did it successfully. But with the help of the rancher um, and an ATV, we were able to use a rope with a loop. Um, the bear was tired. It, it, it had been standing in that water for up to 48 hours. So it was tired. So he wasn't gonna put up much of a fight. So we were able to lower a lasso down into that tank, eventually having that bear step into that lasso, the lasso with, with both front legs. So we were able to get it around his chest. Um, with the aid of an ATV, we were able to pull that bear up. Prior to that, we did, utilize the darts and, and, the, and the telazole. And just after getting the rope on around his chest, we were able to just put a dart in him. So as soon as we started seeing that he was going down, we were able to start pulling him up so that he wouldn't get into the water, put his face in the water and drown. But anyway, with the aid of that ATV, we were able to hoist that bear up out of that tank. Um, we had to pry him out of that man, man cover hole, which wasn't 20 inches in diameter. So we had to actually pry him out of that tank and then release him and lower him down to the ground um we uh ear tag processed the bear we were able to haul him off um, to a different location um we monitored the bear and within a few hours he uh he was back on his feet and we watched him as he um went into the woods um what's neat about this story is we had a, a biologist in the Guadalupe Mountains the last couple of years doing some lion studies and he's had water uh, cameras on waters. And our bear, this exact bear was caught on a camera within a few miles of where we released him um, just a few months ago. Um, it was very apparent that it's our bear due to the ear tag that was caught on, on the picture. We got the ear tag number and everything on the picture. So that it just it was just a, a successful capture relocation. Um, it's kind of, it was one of the funner experiences I've had as a conservation officer. Um, it's one of those that really hit home that you think you've done something for wildlife, and to know to that, that that bear survived and it's still out there doing its thing. It's, it's it brings a lot of gratitude to what we do every day. Well, cool. Well, I just uh, want to take uh, thank you again, Josh. Um, um, thanks again for sharing that story with us today. And I know the folks watching this module are going to enjoy your presentation and, and the information that you shared with us today. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll end today's recording and uh, wish everybody uh, adios and we'll see you at the next one. So thank you. Thank you, Storm. See you later.